I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative imaging scientist. This microcourse is part of a series on filter sets for fluorescence microscopy. You're watching part two, imaging multiple fluorophores and dealing with bleed through. This microcourse assumes that you've watched part one, so if you haven't, I recommend that you stop here and watch part one first. In this microcourse, I'll talk about best practices for imaging specimens that are labeled with more than one fluorophore. In order to design an experiment that uses more than one fluorophore in the same sample, you must know the exact fluorophores you're using. This is because the only way to determine the appropriate filter set to use with a fluorophore, or vice versa, is to examine the spectra for both the fluorophore and the filter set, as I described in part one of this series. And in order to use tools like fpbase.org to generate accurate spectra, you must know the exact fluorophores and filter sets that you're using. Throughout this microcourse, I'll use a specimen that has been labeled with two fluorophores as an example. The names of these hypothetical fluorophores are nuke fluor, which binds to nuke, which localizes to the nucleus, and cytofluor, which binds to cyto, which localizes to the cytoplasm. To image these fluorophores, we're going to use two different filter sets. To image nuke fluor, we'll use filter set N, and to image cytofluor, we'll use filter set C. Imaging multiple fluorophores in the same sample is most commonly performed sequentially by switching between filter sets in the microscope. For the vast majority of fluorescence applications, we acquire images sequentially, and we use monochromatic detectors because they're the most sensitive. So in our example, we would acquire a monochromatic image with filter set N, then switch to filter set C and acquire a second monochromatic image. If we'd like, we can then digitally pseudocolor and merge these two images into one to aid in visualization of the relative localization. It's very important to understand that if we collect images in this way and then label up our figures with the fluorophores that correspond to the filters we used, we are making a critical assumption that the images only contain signal from the fluorophores we intended to image. Unfortunately, this assumption is often incorrect because of bleed through, also known as crosstalk. Bleed through is when fluorescence from a fluorophore is excited and transmitted by a filter set that is being used to image a different fluorophore. We're going to examine bleed through that occurs in our example specimen in which fluorescence from cytofluor is collected when acquiring images with filter set N. In this example, all is fine when we image cytofluor with filter set C. The image contains only signal from cytofluor. However, when we image nuke fluor with filter set N, we detect not only nuke fluor, but also bleed through from cytofluor. If we were to then label these images as nuke fluor and cytofluor, we would be wrong. Matching filters and fluorophores helps us to predict whether bleed through might occur. Let's take a look at the spectra for our example, which we've labeled with nuke fluor and cytofluor. And let's first focus on the excitation and emission of nuke fluor and compare these to the transmission of the excitation and emission filters in filter set N. Filter set N contains an excitation filter that is nicely matched for nuke fluor and an emission filter that will collect nearly all of the emission light. We should get a nice bright image of nuke fluor with this filter set. Our sample also contains cytofluor. Let's look at the spectra for cytofluor relative to the spectra for filter set N to see if we can see why we get bleed through from cytofluor when using filter set N. We can see that cytofluor is excited by the wavelengths of light transmitted by the excitation filter in filter set N. And the emission filter in filter set N transmits cytofluor emission. So in examining the spectra, we can see that it's very likely that we'll detect bleed through of cytofluor when using filter set N. And sure enough, if we collect an image of our specimen using filter set N, we see signal in the nucleus as we expect from nuke fluor, but we also see signal in the cytoplasm where cytofluor localizes. 
If we collected an image with filter set N and assumed all of the signal came from NukeFloor, we would incorrectly conclude that NukeFloor localizes to the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus. Such a bummer. Let's see if we can block this bleed through by using a different filter set to image NukeFloor, filter set N2. This set contains the same excitation filter, but a different emission filter. And the emission filter transmits less of the emission from Nook Floor than the previous emission filter, but it still gets the majority of it. However, unlike the previous emission filter, this emission filter blocks the emission from Cytofloor. So when image is collected using filter set N2, we no longer see signal in the cytoplasm. Clearly, choice of fluorophores and filters can have a major impact, and examining spectra is useful for choosing fluorophores and filter sets that are less likely to result in bleed-through, but the only way to be sure bleed-through is not present in your images is to control for it. Controlling for bleed-through is absolutely required for all co-localization experiments. So how can you determine if any of the signal in your image is a result of bleed-through? When we image nuke floor with filter set N, we detect both nuke floor and bleed through from cytofloor. So the control specimen that would reveal bleed through is one that does not contain nuke floor. If we image a sample that does not contain nuke floor with filter set N, we know that any signal that we see is coming from something other than nuke floor. We call these single labeled controls. To perform the necessary controls for a specimen labeled with two fluorophores, you should prepare four different types of samples. The first sample we need is the experimental sample labeled with both fluorophores, in our example nucleflora and cytofluor. We also need a single labeled control that has been labeled with only nucleflora and a single labeled control labeled with only cytofluor. Both of these controls should be prepared using the exact labeling protocol used for the experimental sample. Just leave the fluorophore out. Biological samples can also contain autofluorescence, fluorescence that is present in the sample itself. So while we're at it, we'll throw in an unlabeled control that we'll use to see if the sample contains any detectable autofluorescence. To collect images of the controls, begin with the sample labeled with all of the fluorophores. Use this sample to set up acquisition parameters, illumination intensity, camera settings, etc., that result in adequate signal to noise ratio for your analysis pipeline. Use these exact same settings for all of the remaining control samples. Now let's collect images of the control samples. Put the unlabeled control on the microscope and collect images using each filter set. No signal in these images means no detectable autofluorescence. If you do see autofluorescence, you can try to reduce it using some of the suggestions I'll give later for reducing bleed through. Now put one of the single labeled controls on the microscope and collect images with each filter set. Here we can see that the image collected with filter set C does not contain any detectable bleed through from nuke floor. Now put another one of the single labeled controls on the microscope and collect images with each filter set. In this case, we see signal in the image collected with filter set N. We know it's not nuke floor and we've ruled out autofluorescence. So we can conclude that we are collecting cytofluor bleed through with filter set N. So now what? There are actually many different strategies that can be used for dealing with bleed through. I'll go through some of the ones that we found to be effective. None of these strategies are the best one that will work for all experiments. For each strategy, there are downsides, trade-offs that must be made in order to reduce bleed through in the images. So it's best to consider all of them and maybe try more than one to determine which works best for your sample and your experiment. We've already discussed one strategy that might help us reduce bleed through, changing filters in the microscope. In our example specimen, changing emission filters greatly reduce bleed through. There are downsides to this approach that may or may not affect your experiment. One trade-off is that narrow bandpass filters often block not only bleed through, but also some of the emission light from the fluorophore of interest. In addition, in this example, even though filter set N doesn't transmit bleed through from cytofluor, it does excite cytofluor. This means that while we're imaging nuke floor with filter set N, we're photobleaching cytofluor.
So another trade-off with this approach is that changing only the emission filter will not prevent photo bleaching. If this photo bleaching is a problem for your experiment, you can also consider changing excitation filters. This isn't possible for our example since nuke fluor and cytofluor are excited by similar wavelengths. In many cases, and pretty much always when trying to image four or more fluorophores in the same sample, changing filter sets alone will not be sufficient to adequately reduce bleed through. So now let's think about adjustments that can be made to the sample and image acquisition of the sample that might help. The most obvious change you can make to the sample is to change fluorophores. For example, while cytofluor is excited by filter set N, cytofluor 2 is not. But when switching fluorophores, carefully examine the spectra because you may find that you need to change filters as well. There are additional strategies for reducing bleed through by making changes to the sample. These strategies are essentially a balancing act and understanding the different approaches requires thinking about the relative amounts of fluorophore present in the sample and the amount of photons we collect when acquiring images. In our example, this means thinking about the relative amounts of cytofluor, nuke fluor, and how they affect the amount of cytofluor bleed through we detect in the nuke fluor image. I think it's helpful to start by reviewing the things that can change the intensity of signal we see in a fluorescence image, because these things help determine whether or not we detect bleed through. We can collect more fluorescence from our sample by increasing the intensity of illumination and by adjusting the detector to, for example, use longer exposure times or camera binning. We can also change the intensity of images by changing the sample. Let's zoom in on our example and think at the level of the molecules in the sample. We've labeled the target molecule cyto with the fluorophore cytofluor. If our sample contained more of the target cyto, the fluorescence in the sample would be brighter. It would also be brighter if we used a brighter fluorophore or if there were more fluorophore bound to each target. In thinking through approaches to reducing bleed through in images, it's also important to keep in mind that the intensity of cytofluor fluorescence affects the intensity of bleed through. The relationship between intensity of cytofluor and intensity of the bleed through can be examined using the cytofluor only control. If we plot the intensity values, also known as grayscale values, of the pixels in the filter set C image against the intensity values of the pixels in the filter set N image, we'll see that they have a linear relationship. This is because both the intensity of the image of the cytofluor and the intensity of the image of the bleed through of the cytofluor depend on the brightness of the cytofluor in the sample. So as we change the intensity of cytofluor in the sample, the intensity of the cytofluor and the bleed through both change. Now let's take these concepts and consider ways we could change our sample and image acquisition to reduce the intensity and detection of bleed through relative to the signal from cytofluor and nuke fluor. One adjustment you can consider making to your sample is to decrease the intensity of the cytofluor fluorescence which will in turn decrease the intensity of the cytofluor bleed through in the nuke fluor image. This can be achieved by decreasing the concentration of antibody or dye, by decreasing the expression level of a fluorescent protein conjugate, or by labeling with a dimmer fluorophore. These approaches have the downside of decreasing the signal to noise ratio of the cytofluor image, but we can compensate for that by adjusting the cytofluor acquisition settings, for example, by increasing the illumination intensity or the camera exposure time. The trade-off here is that increasing exposure to illumination will increase cytofluor photobleaching. It's also quite useful to think about the relative concentrations of the targets in your sample. In many cases, one target is in higher abundance in the sample than another. For example, there might be a lot of cyto in our sample, but only a small amount of nuke. To help balance that out, label more abundant targets with dimmer fluorophores or lower concentration of fluorophores and less abundant targets with brighter fluorophores or higher concentrations of fluorophores. Finally, adjust illumination or exposure times to reduce detection of bleed through.
This strategy can be as simple as swapping fluorophores on secondary antibodies, and when possible, it's often very effective. You can get more information on the brightness of different fluorophores on fpbase.org. If you're unable to reduce bleed through on the acquisition side, another strategy is to subtract bleed through from images post acquisition. Because of the linear relationship between the intensity of the cytofluor image and the intensity of the bleed through, we can use the cytofluor image to calculate the expected bleed through in the nuke floor image. Image shape plugins for calculating bleed through coefficient can be found in Fiji. These plugins and instructions on how to use them are easy to find. If you have questions on how to use these open source software packages to calculate bleed through coefficient, you can get expert help on the image analysis forum at image.sc. We can now use the calculated bleed through coefficient to correct the experimental images labeled with nuke floor and cytofluor. Multiplying the cytofluor image by this number will result in an image of the bleed through. This image can then be subtracted from the nuke floor image to obtain a bleed-through corrected image. Of course, there are downsides to this approach as well. First, the control images don't always result in an accurate bleed-through coefficient, so the potential for both over and under correction is pretty high. You therefore must always use control images to validate that the correction is working. In addition, the Poisson noise associated with the bleed through is not subtracted in this correction, so images corrected computationally will have a lower signal to noise ratio than those in which the bleed through was reduced in the sample or at the microscope. If you'd like more information on these topics, check out Anna's review in Journal of Cell Biology. If you have questions, you can find folks that have experience with these methods on the microscopy discussion platform Microforum. I hope this was helpful. Remember to always control for bleed through.